my channel, my name's Petty and my channel name is Nella Grace. If you're new to this channel, then welcome. Don't forget to subscribe. This video is part two of the video, why I keep the Sabbath, why I keep the seventh day Sabbath of the Bible. If you haven't watched part one of this video, then you need to pause this video, go watch that first and then come back to this video because this video might not make full sense in itself if you don't watch part one of this video. If so if you watched the first video, we were talking about the Sabbath, why keeping the Sabbath is very important and why God requires us to keep the Sabbath as part of the Ten Commandments, just like all the other Ten Commandments, why we are required to keep the law. I did mention that I do not believe that keeping the law will save you. You are not saved by the law, you are not saved by works, but you are saved by grace. Salvation is a free gift from God. However, even the Bible says that faith without works is dead. <laughs> You know, you are saved by faith, but your faith is also shown in your life by your works. You keep the commandment of God because you are saved. You are not saved by your commandment of God. Because I am saved, I want to show that through keeping the commandment of God. So the first question I'll tackle is the idea that we are under the new covenant. That the, old, the Ten Commandments, all of that is part of the old covenant. That is bondage. That is, you know, we're not required to keep the Ten Commandments anymore. We are under grace. Uh, we are part of the new covenant, we are new covenant Christians, which is all fantastic. We are new covenant Christians. There was an old covenant there, and there is a new covenant. So we are going to go straight into the Bible to understand and study what is the old covenant, what is the new covenant and what does that mean? Does that mean we no longer have to keep the Ten Commandments? Is the Ten Commandments the old covenant? And do we no longer have to keep them? Let's jump right into this Bible study. Don't forget your Bible, your notebook and a pet. So the, the idea of the Old and New Covenant, as it said in those words, comes from Hebrews chapter 8 from verse 6 to 13. This is where um, Paul specifically mentions the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, what was wrong with the Old Covenant and how it was rectified in the New Covenant. And just a background, the verses before this is talking about Jesus being a high priest and is comparing um, Jesus' high priestly mission of work to like high priest of the earth and he's just basically going into what Jesus is a high priest high priest for us now in heaven what that means so this is how the verse starts that then goes delves into the old and new covenant this is hebrews chapter 8 if you've got your bibles from verse 6 to 13 and it says says but in fact the ministry jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant which he is a mediator is superior to the old one since the new covenant is established on better promises for there had been nothing for if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant no place would have been sought for another but God found fault with the people and said the days are coming declares the Lord when I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them declares the Lord this is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time declares the Lord I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their heart. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to the one another, know the Lord because they will all know me from the greatest to them, to the, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Now, from these verses, we find three things that are said about the old covenant that are, re that are rectified in the new covenant. It was based on Paul's promises, it was found faulty, something was found faulty, and also it was to be abolished. So, let's go into the Old Testament to see what exactly is the old covenant so we can get a better understanding of what is the new covenant. The Old Covenant was established on Mount Sinai. This is before the law was given. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 3 to 6, God says to Moses, Go tell my children, go tell my people, Israel, that if they obey my word and if they do what I ask them to do, I will bless them, I will make them a holy nation, and I will make them peculiar people. This is an agreement that God asked Moses to go and put before the children of Israel and say, will you do this? If I give you my commandments, will you obey my commandments? And will you do what I ask you to do? And I will bless you and I will make you holy. See what a covenant is, is an agreement between two parties based on mutual promises. So here the covenant was, God says, I will do this, this and this, if you do this, this and this. 
Is there an agreement or not? She will make a covenant. She will seal this thing. Let's do this thing. Moses, go tell my people that I will do this if they do this. Are they up for it? This is what it is. This is where the old covenant was first introduced to the people of Israel. So you notice how God asked Moses to to present his offer before his people. If you jump down to Exodus 19 verse 78, Moses goes to the people and says, God has said this, this and this. Will you do it? And they say, yes, all that you have spoken, Moses, we will do it. God promises to do this, this and this. The Israelites, the people of God promise to do this, this and this. Hence, a covenant is made, an agreement is made. It's based on mutual promises. An agreement was made, a covenant was made by both parties. So Moses goes back to God and says, you know what? They are willing to do it. They will do what you have asked them to do because they said, yes, we will do it, God, and we're up for it. So just as soon as Moses went back to the people and said, you know what, God, they're willing to do it, the covenant was set up. But before it could go into fruition, just like anything else in the Old Testament, there had to be a ceiling, a ceiling of this covenant to come to, to come to fruition. And that was ceiling by blood. This is where you go. We jumped Exodus chapter 24, verse 4 to 8, that this covenant was sealed by the sprinkling of the blood of an ox. And you can go read that for yourself and see exactly how that was done. So before the commandments are given, God says, you know what, the people of Israel, I'm going to do, give you commandments. I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you to do this, this and this. Will you do it? And if you do it, I'll bless you. I'll make you this, this and this. And they say, yes, okay, we will do it. You know, we are your people. We are the Israelites. We are God's people. We're going to do it. We promise God. God says, okay, let's seal this thing. The blood of an ox is given, sprinkled. The covenant is set up and it's going. So here you can see that the Ten Commandments themselves were not the Old Covenant. They were the basis of the Old Covenant, but they were not the covenant in, the, in itself. The covenant was the agreement between God and his people. They promised each other that they would keep the commandments, God would bless them, and then that was sealed. The Ten Commandments in themselves were not the covenant. They were just the basis of the covenant. Just like if you agree with someone, you know what, if you do this for me, I will do this for you. That is the agreement, that is the covenant, not the thing which you promised to do. That is just the basis of the agreement, but it's not the agreement in itself. The agreement is what you promised each other to do. That is the old covenant. They promised to do this, God promised to do that, it was sealed. So now that we've established that, what went wrong? <laughs> Why did that have to be abolished? What went wrong? Here we go back to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 to 13. The first problem that was wrong with the covenant, it was made on poor promises. And it was, but whose promises were poor? Was it God's or the people? See, the problem was with the people of Israel. They said that, God, we promise to keep your word. We promise to keep your commandments. Not once did they say, God, we will do it with your help. Not once did they ask God for help if, with that promise. They just said, yes, we'll do it. And they, they were reliant on their own power. Before Moses even came back down the second time, when he went back up to say God yes and God gave him the um, commandments, before he could even come back down, they'd already broken their promise. They were already worshiping idols. They were already just back to their Egypt, Egyptian ways. They completely broke the promise. And you can see throughout all the history of the Israelites, throughout all of their journey, time after time, repeatedly broke the promise that they gave to God that they will keep the commandments of God. They broke that promise. It was not God. God still blessed them. God still made them a holy nation. God still made them a peculiar people. Time after time, he chased and chased after them, but they broke their promises because they were reliant on themselves. If you look carefully with Hebrews chapter 8, it says in verse 8, it says, For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come when the, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. What was faulty? Was it the, the Ten Commandments, the basis of the covenant, or was it the people? The Bible is clear that the fault was found with them, with the people. Before that, it says that if, if the first covenant had been faultless, then we wouldn't have needed a second one. But there was fault. Fault was found with the people. And in verse 9 of Hebrews 6, God says, Because they continued not in my covenant, I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So it was the people. God, the people were found fault. They continued not in the covenant. The God, God was like, yo, like this is, you've made poor promises. You have not kept the, your side of the deal, you know, and it was found fault with them. So then that comes, that brings the question. So what is the new covenant and how did that make the old covenant better? The Bible is clear in itself. It says that for this is the new covenant, 
that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me my people. See, God's promises were still the same. He still said, yo, I will make you, you will be my people, and I am going to bless you. His promises were still the same, meaning that the first time, it wasn't, the poor promises wasn't from him. And also, it was from the people. You see, the basis of the covenant has not changed. The basis of the covenant from the first time was the law. The second time, the basis of the covenant is still the law. Why? Because God says that I will put my laws on their hearts and on their minds. I will put my Ten Commandments in their hearts and in their minds. The problem with the first is that, okay, first of all, the, tab was, the, the law was on tablets and those people were relying on themselves to keep this law. God says instead, I will put my law in their hearts and their minds and I will help them to it. He doesn't ask anything from us. He doesn't ask us to make a promise back. He doesn't ask us. He says, you know what? I'm just going to put my law in your heart, in your heart and in your mind. And I will make sure that I will help you to keep the law instead of those guys who were like, yeah, we'll do it. God will do it by ourselves. God says the law is still valid. It's still there. The new covenant is just that instead of you relying on yourself, you are going to rely on the blood of Jesus Christ. And just like the first time when the, the old covenant was sealed with the blood of an ox, this new covenant, us as new covenant Christians, this new covenant was sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. It's still the same thing. Blood was to seal. This time, blood of Jesus seals this new covenant and helps us. Jesus Christ is our righteousness. He helps us to keep the law of God which he has promised to help us and he's also promised to make us his people and he's promised to write this law in our hearts and our minds and we have no part to play in keeping the commandments. It is the power of Jesus Christ that keeps us and that helps us to keep the commandments. This is how the old covenant was rectified. The, it did, the new covenant does not do away with the commandments the commandments are still there. When we are new covenant Christians, all that means is we believe in the power of Jesus Christ and the blood of the Lamb to help us keep the commandments of God, just as the Bible has just said. And he has taken away the old covenant based on poor promises, based on faulty people, abolished it. This is the new covenant and we as new covenant Christians are to keep the law through the help of Jesus Christ our Savior. This is exactly why Paul writes in Hebrews chapter 13, from verse 20, he says, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that the shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will working within you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever amen this is the principle of the new covenant God will work in us through us with us in order for us to keep his commandments. It is now his work and not ours. And another way to look at this is the 10 commandments in themselves. The old covenant was found faulty. It was based on poor promises and it was abolished. If you look, if, if for example, let's say that the covenant in itself was the 10 commandments. If the 10 commandments faulty, Paul himself in Romans chapter seven says that the law is holy, the commandment is holy, unjust and good. The same writer, how can, would it make sense for the same writer to call the, to call the law good and holy and just, and then just a chapter later say, actually, no, but that was abolished, you know, it wasn't perfect, it was faulty. Doesn't make sense. That would, the, the Bible would be contradicting himself. The same writer would be contradicting himself. The law of God is not faulty. Even in Psalms says that law of God is perfect converting the soul. The law of God is not faulty, so the Ten Commandments in themselves can't be the Old Covenant because there's no fault in the Ten Commandments in themselves. Now the second thing that we learn about the Old Covenant that was wrong with it is the fact that it was based on poor promises. So if the Old Covenant was the Ten Commandments, can we see anywhere in the Bible where, the, where it says that the Ten Commandments are based on poor promises? No. In fact, the only commandment of the Ten Commandments that it has a promise in it is that children obey your mother and father for your years shall be long on this earth. Paul himself, the same writer, upholds this very commandment. He says that you should keep this commandment for this is right. He says this in Ephesians 6 verse 1 to 3. He says that, you know what, children, obey your parents for this is right. You know, and then he upholds this same commandment that, was, that had a promise in it. There's nowhere in the Bible that we can find 
that the Ten Commandments were faulty or had poor promises like in themselves. Now the last thing that we learn is that this Old Covenant was to be abolished. If we put the Ten Commandments as being the Old Test, the Old Covenant, has the Ten Commandments been abolished according to the Bible? No. Jesus himself, when he was on earth, he said that he, in Matthew 5, he said that, think not that I come to destroy the law. I have not come to destroy the law, but I have come to fulfill it. He said that, don't it, get it confused, you know? He says that nothing shall be taken out of the law until all is fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass and nothing shall be taken from the law. And specifically, since we're talking on the subject of the Sabbath, Jesus himself in Matthew 24, he's talking to the disciples and he's telling them about, you know, to prepare themselves for the destruction of Jerusalem or specifically as he says in verse 15 he says the abomination of the desolation that is which was spoken by in Daniel this is the prophecy basically talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and he says that to them and this didn't happen for 40 years after Jesus had resurrected but he was telling the disciples and instructing them that you better hope that when that happens that your flight might not be on the Sabbath day he was talking about the fleeing and the destruction of Jer Jerusalem, which wasn't to happen until after he died. He still expected them to be keeping the Sabbath, which means he is still expected for the Lord to still be in motion. Hence why he was telling them, oh, well, I hope that you better wish that your fleeing will not be on the Sabbath day. So where would we get the idea that the Ten Commandments have been abolished? Christians, we all believe that the Ten Commandments are still there. Otherwise, we would be killing and stealing and lying. You, believe, you don't do those things because you know that they're against the law of God. However, when it comes to this one commandment, which is the Sabbath, people seem to say, oh, whoa, the Ten Commandments have been abolished. We don't have to keep them anymore. But, but we don't steal and we don't kill and we don't commit adultery, you know? That's still part of the Ten Commandments. And all of those were re-established in, in the New Testament, one way or the other. However, I do acknowledge that there was a law that was abolished. That is also clear from the Word of God. As I mentioned before, there was a law of God which was in the Ark of the Covenant and then there was the law of Moses which was in, on a scroll written by Moses contained in ordinances and that was outside of the Ark and that was on the side and this was called the ceremonial law. The moral law which is the Ten Commandments was separate to the ceremonial law. And this is why people get a bit confused when they use verses such as Colossians 2 from verse 14 which reads blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took out the way nailing it his to the cross and if we jump down to verse 16 it says let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or in the new moon or the sabbath days and then if we jump down to verse 18 oh verse 17 still it says which are a shadow of things to come but the body is of christ and also ephesians 2 15 is another verse and it says Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, <laughs> even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And then another verse also is Galatians 3 verse 19, and it says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come, to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hands of the mediator. And this is just some of some verses out of many that people use to say that well the law has been has been abolished. Here, if you study this properly and you look into the context of which Paul was talking about, he's not talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about the ceremonial law. Why? Because the ceremonial law was given in order. It was a foreshadow, as this is said. It was the law which was contained in ordinances. It was the foreshadow. What does that mean? It was to help the Israelites, the people of God, to realize who Jesus was. There were so many ceremonies, like circumcision, like different holy days or Sabbaths, as they would call them. There were like annual festivals that they were to do, annual um, days that they kept, which they called holy Sabbaths. I think it was like six of them a year. And these were like ceremonies which pointed to Jesus Christ, which point, which were a foreshadow of things to come. This is why Paul says, it was, to, it was to be till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. It was only to come until Jesus. There were so many ceremonies. This is the ceremonial law. This is why even in the sanctuary, it was kept outside of the ark. It was written by Moses, not by God. It was a ceremony, ceremonies which contained circumcision and all that stuff, which is also why in the same book in Romans 5, he's still talking about the law because what we've just read in Romans 4, he's still talking about this law. He says that, for if I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he's a debtor to the whole law, 
Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Here you can see that he still uses the same word, law. But however, you have to read by context and understanding to see what law he's talking about, because there's plenty of laws in the Bible. And here we're specifically talking about the ceremonial and the moral law. How do we know that's the ceremonial law? He mentioned circumcision. He's saying that if you are still circumcised, because by this time Jesus has died, and he's telling the people that if you're still practicing circumcision, you're thinking that's what is important, you are under the bondage of that law. You are under the bondage of the law of the Old Testament, the ceremonial law, and you're not under Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ came to abolish all of that. As soon as Jesus Christ died on the cross, he abolished the ceremonial law. He, there was no need. We don't need to sacrifice sheep or lamb anymore. We don't need to be circumcised anymore. We don't need to keep in all these holy days that they kept, annual festivals, which they kept anymore because they were just a foreshadow of things to come, a foreshadow of Christ. This is what is meant throughout these verses that people use like, oh, do not judge me, even when Paul says um, in another verse that you should, people should not judge you on what you eat or drink or Sabbath days. Again, it says Sabbath days or it said Sabbaths. This is because, again, there were so many different annual feasts or annual days, annual festivals that were called Sabbaths. It was to be Sabbaths unto them. They no longer had to keep those anymore. This is separate to the Sabbath day of the Lord, singular. The Sabbath, seven day Sabbath is separate to the Sabbaths of the annual festivals that they used to keep and that was part of the ceremonial law and that was done away with. That is not part of the Ten Commandments. Circumcision, all of that stuff is not part of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, Paul calls it the law of liberty, is the law of freedom, is the law of love and the ceremonial law is the law of bondage, is the law, is the law that was to be done away with. We're not under the law anymore because we believe in Jesus Christ. He came and he was that lamb that they were sacrificing back then looking forward to him. He came, he died as the lamb, and therefore he fulfilled that law and we no longer have to keep all of those laws. And we have to be so careful when we study Paul's writings, because even Peter says, 2 Peter 3 verse 16, he says that he writes, talking about Paul, Paul's writings, he says that he writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. This is just the perfect verse to use that when we read Paul's writings, we can't take them on the surface. You can't take a verse that says, no one should judge you in eat or drink or meat or holy days or Sabbath days and be like, yep, that means we don't keep the Sabbath anymore. No, you have to study the context, study what it's saying, what is Sabbath days. You know, it didn't say a Sabbath day. Things like that you have to understand because Paul's writings, some of them are very hard to understand. So just that's just to establish that the law was not done away with. The Bible doesn't say that. If you might un understand it too if you don't understand what it's talking about or what law it's talking about in so many other verses that I could come up with. With this mind, with this in mind, if that was your question, well, I thought the law was done away with. Go back and read those verses that you maybe thought is what that was saying and try to understand what it's actually saying, what law it's talking about and what the chapter is saying in context to that. Just the last few points before I finish, I'm not going to cover everything in these two videos because it's just a lot, it's a whole big study, but if you want me to, comment down below and like this video and I will. But just another thing, some people believe that Sunday is the new Sabbath, that it was changed. Again, nowhere in the Bible does it say this. Sunday, the word Sunday or Saturday is not actually mentioned in the Bible, however the word first day is mentioned in the New Testament. Nowhere in those verses, which I will put here, nowhere in those verses does it bring a new commandment that Sunday is now the day to worship. For example, a verse that people might use sometimes to say, well, the disciples kept Sunday and they broke bread on Sunday, so therefore Sunday is the new Sabbath, is Acts chapter 20 from verse 7. And it says, On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continues his speech and, and continued his speech until midnight. Here you can actually see what actually happens here is that it's the first day in the terms of in terms of that, like we mentioned in part one of this video, that days in biblical time, they kept days from even unto even, because that's how biblical days went. Because they didn't have clocks like we do, you know. To us, midnight is midnight because a clock tells us that. However, they kept according to the sun. When the sun sets, you were now in the in the next day. And that comes even from, from Genesis, you know. 
from even unto even, you know, when the evening came and the morning came, that was the first day. We mentioned that in part one. If you haven't watched that, go watch that so you can get a better explanation of that. Basically, this was actually Saturday evening. This was a Saturday evening meeting. This is why it says that Paul preached until midnight because they had just finished the Sabbath. They were stuck and it was now sunset. Paul continued to preach until midnight. He actually preached so long. It says later on that someone fell and died and then Paul ended up res resurrecting them. But the main point of this is that is not saying that people should now meet on a Sunday. P the Sunday is now the Sabbath. No, they were just meeting because they were finishing the Sabbath. It was Saturday evening. Paul got so excited preaching, he preached until midnight because he knew that he was traveling the next day, which it says that. It's all just logical sense. That doesn't mean that there's a new commandment that Sunday is now the new day to worship. Some people keep Sunday again because they say we honor the resurrection. You could use that same argument and say, well, I'm going to keep Friday because Jesus died on Friday and I'm honoring his death. No, the Bible has already given us, again, a way to keep Jesus' death and resurrection and that is through baptism. Baptism is the, is the ceremony that we have been given by God to say that this is how you should honor my death and my resurrection. There's so many other arguments that people bring in order for them to justify not keeping the Sabbath of the Bible, for not having to worship God how he requires us to worship. And I'm just gonna leave you with this thought. In Genesis chapter four, we see the story of Cain and Abel. Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain, on the other hand, he was a tiller of the ground. So when it came to giving God his sacrifices, Cain brought the first fruit of the ground. He brought vegetables and, and you know, fruits and whatever, everything. He was a tiller of the ground, so he brought the first fruit. Abel, on the other hand, he brought sheep as the offerings because this is what God had asked them to do. God had asked them for a specific sacrifice for him to honor him. Cain brought, I'm sure it was something that was very genuine, very sincere from his heart because this is what he found important. However, it was not what God had required. It was not what God had asked. These both were sacrifices. These both were probably sincere from the heart. However, one was one that God actually asked for and one wasn't. And guess what? God didn't accept, accept Cain's sacrifice. God did not accept Cain's sacrifice. God did not accept Cain's worship. That sacrifice was a form of worship towards God. God didn't accept Cain's worship. Fire didn't come down. Fire came down for Abel. Cain got, this is why Cain ended up killing Abel because Cain got so jealous of Abel and he ended up killing him. At the end of the day, you might be sincerely, sincerely keeping Sunday as your Sabbath because you thought that was the right thing to do. Maybe you didn't really understand and you thought, any day is any day. You know, I keep the spirit of the law and not the letter of the law, which in itself is a whole video in itself. But maybe you didn't know, maybe you were sincerely worshiping God in how you thought was the way to worship God. However, now God is telling you that this is how specifically I want to be worshiped. And God is serious about his commandments. God is serious about what he asks and requires from us because just as we see in this story, he did not accept Cain's worship. He didn't accept Cain's worship because that's not how he wanted to be worshipped. Don't do anything based on what tradition or anything that the pastor or your mom or anyone tells you. Do something because this, the word of God, has told you so. Do something because this is what you believe in. If you're a Christian, you're a Christ follower, you believe in the word of God. And you should study for yourself, you should understand for yourself. And sometimes you might go, after you read this, you might go and ask your pastor a question about this and they don't believe in this. They'll probably tell you one of the reasons I've just explained in these things. And you know for yourself when you study that that won't be correct. You have to make a decision in your life to follow God for yourself. I hope that I explained to the best of my ability and I hope that the Holy Spirit spoke through me in these last two videos for you to understand what the Sabbath is, why I keep the Sabbath, and why it's important for you in your life to keep the Sabbath. If you're a Christ-believing person, God-fearing person who wants to please God and honor Him and love Him. Thank you so much for watching these two videos. I know they were so long and I just want to thank you for taking out your time and once again, thank you, thank you, thank you. I really enjoyed making this video, guys. Stay blessed. God bless you. I love you. God loves you. And see you later. <laughs>